cerebellum is a very interesting device coming to it from a perspective of an engineer, coming to it from a perspective of a neurophysiologist, the cerebellum performs a lot of computations. Today's talk is about how the cerebellum computes and how these computations can be reconstructed. Uh, throughout this talk, there will be a reference to how these processes work and how these equations are modeled, how these equations represent uh, regular function that are seen in biological systems and how single neurons interact to form complex operations. So the overall picture is cerebellum has several perspectives that one needs to pay attention to. To begin the talk on cerebellum, one needs to know that the approaches are, can be very different. In today's approach, it's the computational neuroscience of the field. So computational neuroscience talks about the development of simulations, the analysis of multi-scale models, the theories of neural function, and you can connect different phenomena like from the level of molecules all the way to cells and circuits. And these are a group of interactions that we talk about as electrical messengers, electrical or chemical signals that one can talk of. But coming to the perspectives of the cerebellum, we have three specific questions that people do ask in computational neuroscience. Cerebellum as a device or as a explored topic is more than 2000 plus years old. So one of the questions that we would love to ask is, do devices like these or do parts, components of these devices react to specific stimuli differently. We also talk about what is called behavior of single neurons or when we simulate, can we see the single neurons, the function of the single neurons as an experimentalist would study it uniquely. And what is in, more interesting is the interpreter version, the network approach looking at, for example, how brain circuits operate. Um, the easiest way to start this question or start asking how to model the cerebellum is to take examples from machine learning. It is very common that cerebellum is a structure of supervised learning. So abstractions can be made from these, these structures and the cerebellar structures that are involved in these kind of super, supervised learning come from the input layer and the molecular layer. The Purkinje cell being what is called the perceptron the, in a cerebellum. So there is a learned action or supervised learning that happens. What is very interesting is that the brain also motivates questions, do we see unsupervised learning? We still, there are questions being explored, but unsupervised learning is more formal in retinal circuits. So there's retinal signals being processed by the cerebellum. So people would like to question, are there beyond associative mapping? Is there some unsupervised learning or clustering in these kind of circuits? And the most crucial in around 2017, we started looking at reinforcement learning in the cerebellar input layer talking about what is happening in these internal loops. Cerebellum is a subcortical structure. It's a very dense piece of tissue with around 80% of neurons and 10% of small volume or, and most of these neurons are very, very tiny. We call them granule cells, for example. We'll come to it, but these are, these ask the question, is there a similarity in the, in terms of movement processing between the cerebellum and the basal ganglia, which is also a very important device, a very important structure in movement signal, in movement processing systems. So let's not worry about the various aspects. Let's talk about why cerebellum is interesting. So if you talk to engineers or talk to anatomists or modelers, the in concept of little brain is very challenging. In fact, cerebellum is ser cervelletto, meaning little brain in Latin. And what is also very computationally interesting is the sparseness of these structures. So cerebellum is known to be a sparse processing device and that raises a couple of questions. We are talking about questions like um, how are we looking at uh, signals being distributed by large number of cells, wh why, why is there some kind of redundancy maintained? The entire theories of cerebellar cortical function is based on some of these studies that came from 1970s, starting with the Mar, Albus, Ito phenomena. So there is a new question that came out in the late 90s, the question of the internal clock, timing as a very critical mechanism that cerebellum runs. And also we ask about the concept of multimodality. Now with pathologies coming up like Parkinson and Alzheimer's being related also to changes in the cerebellum, cerebellar cells, are we looking at very different inputs? By the way, auditory, visual signals do have a pathway directly into the cerebellum. So there's some form of prior learning for some of these signals that are happening. Um, from an engineering angle, what's interesting is the hundreds of millions of cells and their role in processing data. 
I am going to skip a few of these topics and say there are some questions that biologists are trying to work from an engineering angle. Why is there a uni unique or a uniform anatomical organization? What is the relevance of modular structures like cerebellum when there is let us say convergence divergence ratios that are very very different and what is very crucial for many labs in it across the world including ours is to look at how Mar Albus theorem has changed with the recent findings that are being that are changing our perspectives on what these structures process or what these circuits process. To begin this we need to talk about the a very simple basic whenever we study neurons whether it is cerebellum or hippocampus or let us say any part of the cortex we talk about neurons either coming from a traditional non-linear linear NLN cascade or very detailed biophysically constrained compartmental models. These are the common approaches and this has driven a lot of neurons typically the Purkinje cell, the pyramidal neurons to be explored in variety of formats and variety of abstractions and we would definitely say this should not be ignored by biologists or experimenters or modelers together as an ensemble. Let us talk about a very brief perspective of computational modeling. Computational modeling is the translation of what we call as real world problem into simultaneously into a real world solution and a mathematical solution. Of course, to arrive at a mathematical solution you need to look at the mathematical problem and that problem itself becomes a question or a issue to be tackled and that is where computational neuroscience can jump in and answer a lot of simple questions. Uh, not just simple but also very complex and one of the ways to answer it is in computational neuroscience of course you take the basic construct the action potential the spikes or the EPSPs or the currents that you see from neurons and you want to abstract it as a membranal structure and this is a very common study that every neuroscience student would go through and say I can also not only model the activity of a neuron but I can also abstract the activity of a neuron and say this is an event that has that is committed and that comes into a very different systems perspective. So uh, computational neuroscience is not just about modeling neurons but modeling the activity of neurons in the way you want to study and this challenge this asks a variety of questions what exactly are we modeling and we ask these questions by saying what is the nature of action potentials di in different neurons of the cerebellum. Uh, there are cerebellum has very large neurons that are very well studied for what we call as pattern recognition or pattern classification. We have very small neurons that act as amplifiers or modulators typically called the brush cells or and we have a large number of input processing neurons and these are all different functions even though there is similarity in some biological at some biological complexity level these neurons perform different tasks. And to go further on before we enter the cerebellum as a structure as a model perspective to the tools that we use are typical 1900s to, to, to I mean 100 year 120 year theories of Lord Kelvin we use cable properties for whenever, whenever it comes to very detailed biophysical models it is nice to connect them to what is called um, cable properties. So we basically take experimenters value of membrane resistance some form of axial resistance or internal resistance and uh, capacitance and we use electrical circuit electrical engineering principles to create a system. And this is an assumption this is uh, broadly an advice that is given by a group of biophysicists to say a cable, cable equation is a set of assumptions it does not and that too the assumption limits itself to passive membrane properties. We do not know what happens for nonlinear membranes with active channels at the anal uh, analytical mathematical level we only talk about it numerically and this is being used by hundreds and thousands of modelers across the globe to understand how the brain functions. Um, a significant part of the study the cable theory was a success because of what Wilfrid Rahl pronounces it as the theory of dendritic function. He used what is called the 3 by 2 power law to allow modelers to connect more than one cable to a structure. So if you are a student and if you would like to use a platform let us say such as neuron when you say create SOMA which is a simple command you basically create a compartment. If you connect two compartments let us say you create SOMA and a dend and you say connect SOMA of 0 to dend of 1 you are connecting two compartments with this power law which is 3 by 2 power law and this is a significant study there are lots of papers that came out for with uh, 
Idan Segev, John Rinsel and Wilfred Rall talking about all these phenomenal structures and you can connect this with a very simple logic. It says that if you take a parent branch D0, the 3 by 2 or cube the square the the cube the, the square of it 3 by 2 power law says that d0 of 3 by 2 is the sum of d1 of 3 by 2 and d2 of 3 by 2. So, basically you share the conductances and you show a slow decay. With this people were many modelers were able to connect let us say several compartments and make the neurons unique and this is where computational neuroscience take a new takes a new step and this started very detailed modeling of what is called the pyramidal neuron and the Purkinje neuron early late 80s early 90s. And students started evolving these models with more details as they saw from experimental data. To give you a word, let me say that each dendritic tree is mathematically equivalent to a sim single membrane cylinder or a cylindrical structure that can be connected. So, for a mathematician it was much easier to say, okay I understand what you are trying to do, you are abstracting it as a structure. For a biologist it would say, oh I understand where the ion channels are. And for an applied computational neuroscientist, here is a platform of technologies allowing how to construct detailed biophysical models. And these are done so easily that these platforms, the modern computational tools allow you to write single line codes to do all these without even coding. So, there was a secondary evolution that started. Uh, the secondary evolution is people started working on semi-detailed semi models or models that would explain certain capabilities of a function typically what we would call the origins of what Hodgkin and Huxley were given a Nobel Prize for the 1952 ver version of how to connect the sodium channels and the potassium channels into a single equation. However, towards 80s and 90s with Gerstner's and uh, other professors trying to find out what happens when several of such elements interact, people started looking at leaky integrated fire models. Izikiewicz worked on a simple model which was such a popular uh, example used by a large number to produce these large massive models of neural structures. And in the more biophysically similar patterns were fired, were reconstructed using what is called the adaptive exponential integrate and fire models. We would not go into the math, but these are all works that are well distributed across literature and several labs use it and it is pretty much easy to even borrow these models by writing a single line of code. And since they are two equations, they are computationally cost effective. So, when you create a structure of neurons to interact, we are talking about creating a possibility to understand emergence and behavior from, from all these at these all these arising levels. Um, and at the end of the day, I would say we are still looking at what we call as uh, input output membrane voltage based model. So, we do not necessarily using these models, you or me would not necessarily create exact topology of organization or let us say the biophysical behavior or constraint at a single level. But you can use these models to explain a lot of biological function, a lot of bio biophysical principles. Uh, example of it is even today we still use what is called the Hodgkin Huxley model to model ionic behavior. So, if the first step to modeling let us say any unknown neuron would be to use a HH model and fit that to a data and arrive at how the sodium channel functions. Once you have a sodium behavior and the potassium behavior fast sodium and fast potassium as a biologist would refer to it, you have a electrotonic a model of how, an, how that neuron would actually function. When I say electrotonic model, I am talking about the the experimental values of GNA and GK being fixed into a model to generate a spike of a certain behavior. With that, I would go into, I would diversify and say maybe for today's models considering that we are going for the, the US has gone for the brain initiative and the Europe has gone has been doing this human brain initiative people prefer a bit more realistic function. So, if you want to model synapses, people start looking at stochastic synapses, where multiple states of the synapses are represented by simple equations. And again, as an introductory course, this the set of synapses or set of representations are well documented and many of these platforms allow you to code these functions by writing uh, giving a single call. And all you may have to do is fix the conductance from the experimental data and you will get um, a huge set of behaviors that would be very interesting for um, mat patterns that you see with data to match with your patterns that you see in uh, the model of the system. And what is very interesting is that 
uh, stochastic models also allow you to generate what would happen for a continued time process typically not seen for simple synapses. And in our when it comes to cerebellum when we start looking at very detailed models cerebellum being a dense device dense uh, set of tissues with a large number of neurons one of the questions that people would ask us how is cerebellum different and we been asking the same question ourselves an experimentalist would tell you that each neuron performs a variety of unique functions and in order to encode all of that what is very common is that you map the transitions or the changes that you see in these states by using what is called a Markovian model. So a Markov representation basically involves uh, states like C, C3 and C13 which represents a closed behavior to connecting to different substates and then finally to an open state and then you would use an Ohm's law to relate this the fraction of channels at the open state and say this is my behavior and you can take most of these values by studying what is called um, a typical voltage clamp behavior and looking at activation and inactivation patterns of how these neurons function and these are very different neurons. So if there is a genetically different um, encoding of a sodium channel you have a very different behavior in those cerebellar neurons and that is why people get very interested. So coming to the cerebellum as a picture what we think of as cerebellum models is because of its modular architecture and that is something that is very interesting. You all, all as modelers we think of build, collecting a template of neurons and using this template with a certain mapping to create what is called a cerebellar circuit and this changes our picture whether it is. So let me name a few of these cells the primary the largest number of cerebellar neurons are called the granule cells GRCs or the in short represented here by the GRCs. Granule cells are excitatory cells they have both uh, AMPA and NMDA synapses that are excitatory in function and you have a GABA aminobutyric acid input that comes from what is called the Golgi cell. Ga granule cells are 5 to 6 micrometers in diameter very very tiny and very numerous 10 to the power 10 or 10 to the power 9 cells in the cerebellum in the rat cerebellum and Golgi cells are a kind of a larger neurons they are inhibitory in nature they are electro they autorhythmically fire which means that they have a different set of properties and today's world tells you that the co combination of these two cells are primarily what we call as the granule cells the granular layer and inside the granular layer we also have what is called the unipolar breast cells which impinge on the granule cells and they are very few so we ignore them and say let us look at the most populous computational code and that is these, these two ratios of cells. Granule cells axon, granule cell axons go up as ascending axons and they split to become cables and they become what is called parallel fibers or PF as it is called and these PFs impinge on what is called parallel fibers impinge on what is called the Purkinje cell. So if there is a large amount of input that comes in the granule cells from the pontine nuclei through the mossy fiber pathway granule cells process this input and give this input as an in an encoded or a, let us say sparsely encoded format into Purkinje cells. The sparsely encoded format is something that we need to talk about because in the last 10 years we think granule cells also do what is called dense coding and that is something that is very unique because a group of granule cells act as a cluster and that adds a computational property to this layer. These Purkinje cells are the primary outputs of what is called the motor cortex and people have been modeling Purkinje cells with different properties there are different models since the 90s even till 2015. Some of these papers have come out from Pavia, Japan and uh, these labs have been working on understanding how these ion channels code for certain properties. Purkinje cells receive inhibitory inputs from two kind of molecule, molecular layer interneurons otherwise called the MLIs, uh, the stellate and the basket cells. They are much lesser but the, the sole output of the Purkinje cell goes into what is called the deep cerebellar nucleus or the primary, the main output of the cerebellum itself. Deep CN as it is called is the primary output but along with deep CN we also have uh, interaction that comes from the climbing fibers which is from the inferior olives. So as a missionary there are quite a few loops but they are not as many as we cannot identify and this is why cerebellum is an interesting loop structure. Um, we will start with a simple example to model a cerebellum we need to model a cell. So we, my, 
our work primarily started by understanding how why why are there so many quests so many neurons and if they are very tiny neurons do they make any sense so we started working with what is called granule cells way back and we created not only single compartmental models but also multi compartmental models multi compartmental means that we used different compartments representing different parts of the neuron connected using the 3 by 2 power law so this model for example is a published paper uh, you is openly available on model db one can download it use it has a lot of channels the common channels that has been studied for so it takes 20 years for many labs to identify the channels and some lucky student just goes there and gets all these channels puts it into a model and calls it a fantastic granule cell and that's how it works it's a, it's a it's a very compact neuron it processes lot of input lot of signals auditory visual movement timing lot of things but we never ask the question why is there so many of these tiny neurons and why is that only a few neurons work and we'll come to this question granule cells receive two kinds of synapses typically the excitatory synapses from the mossy fibers and the inhibitory synapses coming from the golgi cell which the golgi neuron and the granule neuron receive inputs directly from the, at the same time from the same set of mossy fiber mossy fibers and what's interesting is this creates what is called a feedback loop or feed forward loop the feed forward loop is from the mossy fiber golgi cell and they're on creating a transformation of the input the sodium channels in the granule cell are mostly located immunohistochemical studies suggest that these channels are primarily located in the hillock which is a small protrusion on from the soma and it extends as the axon so most of the 80% of the content is primarily present in that small region and people would ask why the, probably it has an amplifying factor it's a gain filter you can ask about several questions that would be challenging for these kind of neurons to function so now the question comes in what happens does when you model these equations so you create soma you create dendrites you connect the dendrites you put in channels these channels for example if you look at the sodium channels the sodium channel that we used is a 13 state channel so we used 13 markovian states to connect them and finally the one state called the open state is used to map this behavior once you have it what happens is when you put them all into order and then you take these values from experimental data you automatically get what is called the detailed multi compartmental version of course you need to validate this model so validation means that you take these models execute them and see whether they produce the same patterns that one sees from experimental data so you go to an experimenter's lab you get the pattern or usually you find a paper which says these are the patterns of these neurons and these models should validate those kind of patterns and these are available online there is a the model db is a very sig useful database for most of us to download some of these validated models and test it test these models so the question is when we have 10 power 10 neurons such that would be useful the question why are these neurons even useful so in way back in 2005 i asked this i had the opportunity to ask wilfred rall why he did the cable theory when computers were not even good in the 1960s his suggestion was the more detailed the more biophysically detailed the model is potentially you are revealing much more functionality about the model in fact which is true because biology has some way of saying there is some uniqueness to the functions that i add or th that biology adds so this is something that we would wanted to test out and see can we also generate a simpler version of it and compare these models but to generate a simple model we first validated it and what's nice about detailed models unlike these ad integrate and fire simple models that you talk about that we talked about is that the detailed model could produce patterns that we saw both pharmacologically which means that i block certain channels i can produce those behavioral patterns using the same model i can just turn off the conductance of that particular channel say for example let's say i'm blocking inhibition i turn off inhibition i only process excitation if i turn on inhibition i should see a difference in pattern and in fact that's the beauty of it the detail the model is you can add these functionalities into your system and you can say this is much closer to what i see from a rat or a wister rat cruise to way of the cerebellum so your data matches experimental evidence so when i say our data i'm talking modeling data from a single neuron a single neuron it's already a complex device given that we have all these connections all these ion channels and it takes few seconds to simulate let's say a thousand millisecond let's say 15 seconds now one has to ask as a modeler are we looking at only one fee, one type of models so we would say most of the experimental data at a single neuron level are studied using patch clamp and 
most of them come from acute brain slices, which means we remove these slices and if we float them in buffers and we record them with electrodes. So this is called the in vitro behavior. So the default nature of your model should be that it should represent the variety of the banquet of what we call as the in vitro behavior. And this is what we see. You change, you get the exact match, it's within the range and it's amazing. So you say, okay, so my model finally works. Now let me switch to a scenario. My animal is either alive, anesthetized or my animal is either freely moving, which I call as in vivo. Then the model, can I use the same model? So that what we do is that in vivo animals have only a difference that most of the responses are happen in bursts. So by changing an input style to the system, you can get burst behavior. So using a single model, you can reconstruct what is called the in vitro or the acute brain slices or the in vivo, which is the alive or anesthetized animal. That is the beauty of it. So you have the question that you have a detailed biophysical model. It represents everything that a single neuron does. It is computationally uh, expensive, meaning that you need a lot of computer cycles to do it and you can achieve a lot of properties. So what is nice is that these models you can validate it with experimental data, you can create a variety of behaviors and they are very, very powerful if you want to test the hypothesis of what happens at the neuronal level. Now the question changes, circuits are different and uh, Santiago Ramanu Kayal, Kayal would tell you that neuron doctrine also works but there is also an importance that emergence is an important constraint. So going back to 120 years we can say it is also important that when we, when people model to understand cerebellum or cerebellar circuits using a large ensemble of neurons. In order to do that, what is suggested for today's computation is that if you do not want to waste a lot of time in processing lots of data, one would use only the basic essence of those behaviors, typically what we would call as embedded spiking behavior. And this is very nice, you can create spiking behaviors of large neurons, small neurons, cerebellar neurons, hippocampal neurons, basal ganglion neurons and you can study these kind of functions and you can create a variety of behaviors. So where do you start? You start first by looking at published literature, you identify which neurons are present in the cerebellum. Let us say in our case we started looking at the primary neurons that we thought were very critical, we did not involve everything, but we thought D DCN, inferior olive, the granule cell, the Golgi cell and the Purkinje cell are primary neurons. This is more or less like a cleaned experimental trace. We used or you would tend to use when you have the data, you want to fit the data, uh, you want to fit the model to the data using some kind of a reference tool. So many people have used what is called a genetic algorithm, we use what is called a particle swarm optimizer. It is a fitting technique which allows you to change certain functions and basically create or generate the values that you would say. Uh, I am skipping some of the topics here, but basically what you do is you arrange your fitness function in such a way that you get the values of the key parameters based on the traces that you have from experimental data. Once you have the parameters, basically your simple model is ready a simple spiking model is ready. So what do you do? You take these values, substitute in the equation, run the simulation and say, can I get firing behaviors? That is what these integrate and fire neurons can do. So these simple two equation models can take these original values and reconstruct the firing behaviors of several such neurons and that adds, that adds a lot of mystery and at the same time a lot of open questions. So what we typically say is that you do not have to limit it by any equation, you can do a lot of techniques. Why did we use particle swarm optimization is that particle swarm optimization allows you to do a lot of uh, scaling up, you can do parallel processing and have lots of computational fun with it. So you can use any technique, you can use a generic algorithm, you can use slow learners and you can adapt these values and get a not just single values but a bunch of possible values that you can apply to your model and get a firing behavior. And that is very unique because that is the best part of doing a modeling e exercise because no experimentalist is going to tell you this is the only way granule cell fires. He is going to say these are the possible ranges and this is the statistics related to it. And that is exactly what you want. So you take the experimental data, the study and you fit your model to represent what is called the firing behavior simulator trace. So if your simulator trace looks very close to your data then you say, okay, I think I modeled some firing behavior. What, I, what am I looking at? I am probably looking at the delay between spikes. I am looking at the amplitude of the spike and probably I am looking at the frequency of firing. So the F versus I curve, which is called the frequency versus current curve when I do a current clamp. 
or uh, the Weber's cycle which I would call as a voltage clamp equivalent and I would look at the standard behavior of these firing neurons. And that is very interesting, that is uh, that's where you start with by saying I am starting to build models of neurons. So, we had a biophysical model by the way, granule cell is just an example, we could we could do a lot of other uh, detailed models, we have been working on DCN, there are labs that have been working on the Golgi neuron, there are labs that are working on olivary nucleus, you can build detailed models, but these details are dependent on how much data one has and how much of realism that you need for your purpose of simulation. Cerebellar neuron, on the other hand if you look at spiking neurons, we could match not only, so the fun as a student of, ex, a student who explores these kind of functions, I think I would do not necessarily match with an experimental study, I would also compare it with the other models. So, what was interesting is that when you do these kind of fits, what is in, you can use simple models, two equation models instead of that 1025 equations that you want to solve and create very biophysically realistic spikes that allows you to scale to a large circuit and you can simulate these kind of very interesting models that you call as neurons and you have a variety of these neurons, you have your toolbox ready, that is basically your toolbox to model cerebellum. So, you have the granule cell, the Golgi cell, the Purkinje cell, the inferior olive DCN and other neurons and now you have done what is called a variety of firing patterns and this is where we, st we, where we start saying, okay, so there are possibilities that we can look at and granule neurons are any kind of neuron, neural system can be modeled by common techniques. So, the technique does not necessarily, so you can use any such techniques that generates this data and you can end up creating model cerebellum, model basal ganglia, model hippocampus and so on and that is the challenging part of it. Um, along with neuronal models, one also needs to pay attention to, if you go simple versions for your neurons, it is also clever or it is also an alternative, not to say clever, it is also an alternative to use simple synaptic models. So, instead of using this Markovian models that we were talking of in literature, we pulled out very simple conductance for based equations to create a variety of synaptic behaviors for a possible, let us say, excitatory inhibitory systems or inhibitory neurons. And that is where we start by saying, okay, if I put them all together, I have a mathematical repertoire of a cerebellar network. And that is the beauty of it. You create a mathematical model of a circuit if you know the convergence divergence ratio, that is how many neurons connect to one neuron or how many neurons do one neuron give an output to, otherwise one would be called a convergence number, the other one would be a divergence number and anatomists would give you these numbers from electron micrograph and uh, different other techniques that can be easily done. For example, gel uh, dye based imaging techniques can give you these numbers and you can create a possible uh, representation of what we call a cerebellum. We have two problems. When you build a model, one has to remember, you have to ask the question, am I, is my model constrained? And of course, you can test the system by saying, I can generate a set of patterns, each pattern is constrained. Is, is validated. So, probably my model is close to some form of constraining. So, this is what we say is the advantage of being in silico along. So, an experimentalist would definitely engage many people to look at how cerebellum performs timing and timing related functions using these kind of circuits. So, what we could do is that once you have these large number of neurons, you start putting them with 3D topology. You would assign, even though they are simple non-firing or firing neurons, you would assign them a space in the 3D world and you start reconstructing patterns of excitation or inhibition. And these patterns are quite easy when you compare with the experimental data of firing behavior, you can compare these patterns and say, now I might have a constrained network structure and you can fire them in clusters, you can fire them in behaviors and you can validate these processes. To highlight why do we need to do this? So, granule cell as I told you is a large, is a large number of, there is a large number of granule cells and granule cells work in a convergence ratio where one mossy fiber, let us say a rosette connects to let us say 52 granule cells, that is the standard ratio to, that we think is appropriate for a modeler today. Um, and a Golgi cell on the other hand, which is the inhibitory neuron connects to 3000 such granule cells. So, if I want to model a cell and I want to study a behavior, what would I be interested in? So, cerebellum performs let us say a hand coordination task, a prior learned task. So, I want to look at whether my movement trajectory 
is encoded by the granule cells as a set of timings or as a set of rates or as a set of combination of both or latencies for example. So, we started we can put these networks to for form we can see similar for example, in experimentalists who would study these kind of things in rats or in cats or even in humans. In rats one would typically elicit a response in the whisker pad area, whisker pad is the region near the nose of a human for example, but the equivalent of a whisker pad region and generate certain local field potentials. So, if I put an artificial electrode in my model, can I create those patterns that these signals generate as what we call as local field potentials. They are very important questions because if you want to build a model and you want to sell say that model represents not just single behavior, single cell behavior, but an emergent response you want to see whether you can validate both at both levels both at the single cell level and at the emergent response level. In cats the same experiment would be done uh, Henrik Yontel for example, does it by tapping the paw of a cat. In humans it is a task a movement task a grasp task or a, a grasp movement task things like that. And you can see by, by moving these neurons that you have arranged in a 3D space, you can create geometries using simple models and with these geometries you can validate even though this cannot be studied by an experimentalist because of the large number of neurons involved, a modeler can take these geometries and study it and see whether my output matches the standard response. My neurons are validated, if I put these neurons in a validate in a random format or is my emergent response also validated and I can study that by changing different patterns and that is the beauty of it. And you end up with a picture that says most of these neurons need not necessarily be the same neurons, but the if you match the behav behavioral connectivity probably most of your circuits would approximate some of these functions that you see. That is why probably large number of neurons. So, if when we studied with rats for example, we found out that at a at a particular for a particular mossy fiber input only say 12 percent of the granule neurons would fire the rest had non firing or probably even s silent function. So, we started asking so what are the non why are there so many non firing neurons. So, then we started looking at con configurations that would say that th for every different region of the cerebellum there are different ways with which these clusters are formed and these clusters would be different whether it is motor, whether it is auditory, whether it is visual, but generally the cells that operate these signals are always the same and that is very interesting. So, for an experimentalist this is something that he can only hypothesize here you have a set of tools that will test the, those hypotheses without going through the complication of exactly pinpointing all what individual neurons would be doing. So, here is an example of what we did with granule cells, this took us around uh, uh, it is a, a, a 800 micrometer cubed, 800 micrometer cubed, 400 micrometer cubed simulation uh, space of rat, rat granule neurons and this space generated uh, let us say 20 terabytes of data for every uh, 100 milliseconds of simulation. So, basically what we did was can we study these kind of behaviors by seeing if there is a specific response that you would generate these are detailed biophysical models which means that you would engage clusters of computers to solve these problems and each neurons would be doing different function, different inputs, different combination of inputs based on experimental data. And what you would do is you take out slices and you would see whether I can generate what is called local field potential simultaneously. And this is very interesting when you take what you think your single neuron is doing is not what it does in a circuit. So, you have now a whole set of tools that says you can take these models that were very easy to build you can put them to a different combination and generate different possibilities that these circuits do. So, as such we think cerebellum is not a simple structure, probably it is modular, but it is not a simple organization, probably it has that is why we think there is a lot of learning disabilities that are now associated as a cognitive loss related to the degeneration of neurons in the cerebellum. It is a hypothesis of course, there are new studies coming up and you will see that you validate the model by saying if my cells are far away by recording from those two cells like an experimentalist would do, I can reconstruct it. A typical experimentalist would spend two years to do this kind of a study, for a modeler it is probably a few days to test. So, what are we trying to do as a modeler? We are also trying to reduce the amount of experimentation time by telling them where to experiment, what to experiment and that is a kind of a good question that you would ask as a modeler you need to know why am I building these single neurons 
and then connecting these nonlinear devices with other nonlinear devices and why am I going to what am I going to prove what we t want to see is that brain is a unique device and some parts of the brain are act seemingly linear which cerebellum in some regions do even though they are highly nonlinear even if certain neurons are damaged the structure manages some functions in a seemingly linear fashion and that is where we are very interested at. So, we started taking anesthetized rats and brain slices and started looking at experimenters recording this is by a couple of colleagues of mine Jonathan and Egidio who are both collaborators they have both been looking at how rat slices and rat in vivo structures had been producing these waves. So, as a single neuron in a particular region of recording would generate let us say two spikes for a I am talking about a brain slice which means that you do not have burst of neurons burst of activity and we would start measuring these in the local field potential or the population activity we would start measuring these use I mean very highly filtered noisy waves called negative waves N 2 A N 2 B and we started seeing people experiment as experimentalists these studies would say during plasticity what happens during uh, certain firing behaviors what happens, but you cannot hyp hypothesize are they only related to transmembrane currents and these kind of tests can be done by us who have developed these neurons. By the way before we say that we have to say in vitro and in vivo are very different behaviors. So, in vivo to generate the same behavior one would give a what is called a, a theta burst or a, a, a air puff stimulus to a particular visco pad region like here and would see how these waves would generate here you would see that a burst of spikes would create what is called a trigeminal in, uh, wave and a burst of another burst of spikes would generate a C uh, cortical wave which we uh, which experimental is attribute to cortical inputs coming into the cerebellum and this is how timing is understood in certain circuits. Uh, Let us uh, in this particular part we would ignore the D wave because it is too complex we would study these two waves. So, now that we have models of neurons we started asking can we study these kind of complex waves and what was interesting is we started working on the same neurons that you saw we put them in a particular network like 2D structure and we started measuring with some kind of diffusional jitter what would happen if I um, extract the output coming from an extracellular area which is basically an RC kind of a um, parallel RC kind of a structure that you would mathematically model you would study this extracellular field and you would say and you would club them together to create what is called an average response and what is interesting is that we could reproduce not only one set of pictures we could reproduce a variety of patterns. So, that is the power of um, asking the right questions with the right people. So, you go to an experimentalist and you tell them what what how much distance does these um, excitation pattern exist. So, you need to configure some of those behaviors connect them in a particular topology and then you can generate these kind of uh, different variety or a family of curves and this is exactly where we looked at uh, how certain neurons in the cerebellum would be interest uh, work would work together especially during plastic learning plasticity or learning. We took that out and we said ok we should not limit it to just one set of neurons we created a tool which is publicly available called uh, LFP sim local field potential simulator. So, if you build any neuron you just have to download the simulator say in, uh, insert this one line into that into your code and then you have this pop up GUI or graphical user interface that allows you to generate either from a group of neurons or from a single neuron how these populations would em emerge and uh, I am putting up the reference here or if you just google LFP sim you might be able to see that with our granule neurons or granule neuron clusters you could even generate the same behaviors and that is that is very interesting then you start asking what happens if I want to generate what happens in, in during a multi electrode array experimentalists use what is called a multi electrode array which is a large number of electrodes equally spaced electrodes put over a common brain tissue and simultaneously record what happens at different parts of that tissue whether it is a in vivo brain compon uh, component or whether it is a slice we would use this kind of a matrix and with models we could reconstruct the same shapes the deterioration of shapes can be modeled by using some kind of noises once you have this your repertoire of creating a model circuitry is almost complete. Then you can ask the questions, questions is what does connectivity do to it, what happens when cortical inputs come to the system. So, you might actually prefer that in certain cases 
you may have to use a biophysically detailed model like in the local field potentials it's much more realistic if you have the biophysically realistic model because it has a 3d geometry and then you can give inputs such as what happens when a visual stimuli comes in through the mossy fiber or an auditory stimuli and can the same neural structure process these kind of signals and you will see that certain neurons can do what is called a multimodal behavior if you look at the purkinje cell just to granule cells as I told you is a small structure purkinje cell is a large structure an ar uh, arbor of structures would ha happen which means the dendritic tree is like a uh, is very dense and this would create a pattern of possibilities that you can test so you can ask the question is cerebellum doing let us say modeling uh, capturing the timing of a process is it doing uh, the learning of certain behaviors and you can ask questions like how can I understand the cerebellum for that I would say I would call it the reverse engineering process the abstraction at the level of a robotic system so I can say these are models so they are close to biological realism but they do not represent the biology so what you want to do is ask questions like if I build a cerebellar robot what tasks will it do that is called the reverse engineering the brain the, the second objective of computational neuroscience first being understanding brain and its function from its cell and cellular components the second one is to ask the question if I have a theory of brain function what does it what what other functions can it actually do so we ask the same question we have these neurons as I told you the granule cells the Golgi neurons the Purkinje cells and we start okay what can we abstract from these uh, different neurons that primary neurons that we think about a cerebellar structure does the circuitry tell us a picture so what you do is that you model Purkinje cells or you borrow the model of very good labs there are very nice model DB models that you can borrow you can put them together or you can model your own spiking versions you can take your granule cells you can connect them you can put give the convergence divergence of inhibitory connections from Golgi cells you can also give the feedback connection if you want it will create an extra loop you can give the parallel fiber connection to your Purkinje model you can connect the Purkinje output to the DCN and you can bias your PC behavior with inferior olive circuitry which allows you to generate also the complex spiking as some Purkinje cells would do during certain activities how these cerebellar structures can be abstracted from a different picture if these neurons only perform spike transformation can I say that it takes an input set of features mossy fiber is an encoder these are hypothesis tools so I am making an hypothesis that mossy fiber the input to the cerebellum is an encoder the granular layer is a system processing device an information processing device and the Purkinje layer is a pattern capturer or the pooling layer and I can attach a robotic decoding framework like a multi-layer perceptron and say can I get the output that would say control a robotic arm of course remember um, in most of these current today's theories you would say cerebellum is like a blind, blind device which means it does not receive sensorial inputs to perform corrections but there are corrections that can be learned from a prior action which adds to certain refineness as the process is trained so for a robotic device like a robotic arm or a neuroprosthesis if in the context of India let us say we want to have a sensor free robotic arm rather than doing a very complex uh, inverse kinematics you would rather create a cerebellar abstraction so that is what we did so you have set of models we wanted to see how much of the models make sense the, the, the easiest way to test a neural theory or a robotic function or a, uh, example unit is to create some simp very simple versions of it so we used we took the real world stimulus that comes from a stepper motor or a motor you can convert it into a, a spiking phenomena using uh, algorithms like granular layer encoding or BSA algorithm granular layer encoding is something that we borrowed from a, a collection of granular neuron responses that was already published and we mapped them and said okay some I am taking random data this is not how the brain should work but let me test what my model does so I used this phenomena of how the real granular neurons encode and encoded some random data which could be uh, not the way our brain works but assuming that this is this could be a test tool we could see that we use patterns that are well known which means spiking patterns we abstracted it to a very simple phenomena and we could create patterns that we saw in the cerebellum so we used a non cerebellum representation to create a cerebellum like representation which means a roboticist can basically ask the question is my robot a mini cerebellum rather than asking the question is my system a actual 
representation of biological circuitry. So, once you do that you match the spike patterns and encoding to the validated models and you can ask you can see what happens when a large number of such neurons work. So, you can say I have 5 degrees of freedom or 6 degrees of freedom in my robotic arm if I use a large number of mossy fiber inputs with artificial systems and I scale my cerebellum across the scale what do these neurons do. And we could see like an experimentalist sees we could see that we would have sparseness and we would have certain compactness or dense function and these are what one would be very interested at. Um, we would also see that some neurons like if you connect it with the same data that comes from biological realism that some neurons will remain in either a, what is called a silent state like the way we would expect neurons to behave uh, like the way cerebellum does it on a day to day basis probably not at the exact translation, but we would say this is how the cerebellum would behave and now we might actually have a Purkinje then you, if you connect all these inputs to the Purkinje cell and to the DCN you basically see that you will see phenomena that are seen by biologists also happening in your model and that is exactly what we want or what we want to question how these translations of these models can be done. So, in a bigger picture what we wanted to say of course, uh, if you want to if you want real robots to test and if you need to implement certain rules. So, since our robots are very very dirty and very simple dirty in the sense of having a few motors and not so much money to have sensorial inputs, we use simple learning techniques and we said fast precision learning. Fast precision learning is basically a learning algorithm that allows you to modify the timing of your spiking neurons thereby creating patterns that would be that would be similar to a prior firing pattern. So, basically you learn the system and the, these kind of algorithms can be implemented to make a system move and this is very way uh, um, easier way of saying my representation goes and uh, I would not spend time here, but to just to say if you want to if you want your motor to be moved of course, you need to remap those spikes into some kind of uh, real world number like say data we used an MLP and this is just a representation of that a multi layer perceptron based decoders are available on literature you can download them there are MATLAB codes and things which will allow you to reconstruct some of these phenomena and you can map your spiking data to a non spiking number and you can test whether your robotic arm or a toy robotic arm follows a trajectory. What is interesting is you keep you hold the arm and you see that you can create a cerebellum space based network you test the cerebellum space network with cerebellum based properties and you would map to trajectories in real world called robotic trajectories and you would get patterns that you would think are un, uh, very useful to understand how a cerebellum functions. Of course, this is I use the term cerebellum inspired spiking neural network because it does not represent a real cerebellum. So, when you connect these neurons you can test some of these possibilities and with this you will ask the questions like what did, what what else did I do. So, you can look at pharmacological properties of certain structures when neurons fail for example, in autism certain neurons are disabled NMDA synapse NMDA receptors can be disabled and you can see certain changes in certain function. Of course, in motor function you will have to do what is called a cellular degeneration cellular loss and you can see trajectories going very much approximate and you can see prediction correction changes and things like that. So, you can question back by going back to your model you can with your observation of your robot you can go back and say is this exactly what is happening also in a biological cerebellum on a in a rat cerebellum or in a cat cerebellum and you can pose these questions and go back substitute them with detailed models and see whether they make sense. A cerebellum is a complex device and you need to look at it from a single neuron perspective, you need to look at it from a multi neuron perspective, you need to look at it a, at a circuit level, you need to look at it at different translations, you need to also look at it from an application perspective. So, whether you are a pharmacologist or an engineer or a roboticist or a design specialist you can look at cerebellum and say this could be the function and this is the modular nature of cerebellum allowing you to design it as an adaptive filter or any possibilities. With this I think uh, this module on how to model a cerebellum as an introduction is over.